A score of years have fled on past since I returned back home at last from fighting in a foreign land, the broadsword in my strong right hand, my trusty dagger and my lance were not my sole deliverance. I owe my life to a little man, a drifter, unknown by his clan. We went to war as many do, for lack of better things to do, thinking naught of death or woe, but just how far a man could go if he could be a captain grand. With troops of plenty to command, a pile of riches at his feet, and all the beef a man could eat. <laughs> and plates of apricot and curds and lasses hanging on his words. It seemed to be a fine vocation. Who knew that our final destination could be a lonely pit of doom? A lonely death in a lonely room. A man joined us as we marched away. A man from a place they call Cathay. A most scrofulous man you'd never meet with bloodshot eyes and stinking feet. A reeking man with a wispy beard, his nostrils twitch, your nostrils twitch whenever he neared. Yet lard and kumis was his diet. I don't suggest a dog should try it. <laughs> He'd a robe of sorts, a tatty rag, an armour and a saddle bag, an old, old sword and a rusty knife, and that was all he had in life. The knife looked wicked in poor light. At night or in a tavern fight, but in the vivid light of day, it would scare the shades of hell away. Stretching from the, sorry, for the blade, from tip to guard, stretching nearly half a yard, was a fearsome blend of muck and rust. Quite sure to give you tetanus. <laughs> or set to seniors racking pains and gangrene creeping through your veins. Yes, just a prick from that foul knife would guarantee your shortened life. And you'd be lucky not to catch some nasty cankers fit to match the ones upon the Mongols' bum. You'd surely worry the death to come. <laughs> he followed us from war to war and served as well as many more. He grounds his foemen in the dust, his eyes aflame with battle lust. Yes, he was fearsome in a fight. But in the peace, quiet peace of night, he'd send his little pouch of pay to a family far away. It seemed he had to leave his home, and as a soldier forced to roam, for slighting some or other chap in some lost corner of the map, for, he, for a score of years of soldiering and service to this or that king, we knew no more of the Mongol man, or, how, or of his part in God's great plan. We'd crossed the land from end to end, and we could really call him friend. But now, by now this time, I'd played my hand and risen upwards to command a company in the company's van, where life was but a shortened span, but the pay was good if you would survive and come on through the smoke alive. But in our current fight, a wall that we besieged had made a stall, and sheer brute force was not the way to take the tower and seize the day. And treachery was the thing we needed. And so our council was preceded by a search for men who spoke the lingo to sneak on in. And then by Dingo to open up a sally port. And so, like a torrent of some sort, we'd sneak into the Bailey's walls and grab those beggars in their halls. <laughs> <laughs> and so the greater share of treasure would be the world deserved measure. To any man who had the juice to put his neck inside the noose of our well-known opposing lord. A man, it said, when he was bored, was have his own subjects done in for some imaginary sin. For looking sideways at a cat, for wearing an overly wide hat, for not laughing at his puerile wit, that was the very least of it. He'd find the most delightful ways to end his hapless subjects' days. Their heads, they hung about the place, a snarling richness on each face, to remind each fellow in our crew that this was not a fellow who showed kindness to a failed spy, but rather let the beggar die in many very nasty ways that all took at least several days. <laughs> so when the call went out for men to sneak into the keep and then to open up that sally port, we found the queue was rather short, <laughs> consisting of a single man who had the skills to act the plan. The little Mongol there did stand, his nasty cleaver in his hand. 
a nasty grin upon his face. He said, I like open up the place. But I must have your full support. Because you will know that if I'm caught, my poor old bottom it will settle, a roasting in a boiling kettle. My lads, I don't know if I'm brave enough to carry to the grave the details of your cunning plan, if tortured by that nasty man. So when I call, you come in quick, and we'll go up them. I thought as he left, he's a fool. Or at least exceptionally cool. But he play, I'm glad that he wants the other fellow to get, not me. So off into the dragon's moor he wandered and we heard no more. For two days, then a piercing shout gave word of fight had broken out. And high up on the battlement, a crowd approached with bad intent. The Mongol man who quickly slayed a sergeant with his filthy blade. And then threw, threw out, well beyond the boat, a half brick rat. In the note. Before the weight of numbers told, eight men stretched out before him cold. But one man's never quite enough, though he may have the hero stuff. And so the scrummage bore him down, and with it died the battle sound. We read the note, its tones terse. With little time for flowery verse, it said, if I recall it right, that sometime in the fall of night, the northwest tower's sully port. It had its guards and sentries aboard. By silver from the coming mong, the castle fought but for a song. But strike tonight without delay, the Mongols note went on to say. For how long can the guards stay bought now that their paymaster's caught? The captains dared not fear to make the charge. For with the Mongol <coughs> at large, if he talked here, we stormed the place. An ambush we will surely face, and be cut down like scythed wheat. A gruesome fate we'd surely weep. I spoke up for my company's man. He won't reveal that kind of man. But if he does, we'll pay the fee. The first man through the door is me. And if my men can take the gate, you'll know, you'll know you need no longer wait. But charge on in and seize the day and let that ruthless bastard pay. <laughs> So with a horrid trepidation, fit to cure constipation, I led my men as night did fall up to the darkened castle wall and prized it open the little gate that sealed the wicked tyrant's fate. We took the gatehouse and its crew and let our army march on through out, and our opponents quickly found themselves caught napping and the sound of quarter, quarter filled the air as they threw down their weapons there and begged for mercy on their knees. We took the castle at our ease. Some of my chaps had stormed the door and seized the tyrant. And what's more, they'd strung him up by his scrawny throat and flung his corpse down in the moat. But I went looking deep, deep in the cellar for the lot to find the little Mongol fella who'd held his tongue and saved us all. I found him chained up to a wall, but done for. It was plain to see that butchered him most terribly. He looked at me and slowly said, I hope that rotten bastard's dead. I nodded, yes, I saw him croak. The Mongol smiled as if a joke had brushed the pain from off his face and sent it to some other place. He said, now I can happy die. I swore that I'd outlived that guy. And not this afternoon, you know, but more than 30 years ago, when I was forced to leave my clan for falling foul of that wicked man. When I was young, I cut the dash. And though I was a little rash, it's not as if I even knew that twas his lovely daughter who <laughs> I dallied with that afternoon. And she was radiant as the moon, and so in love was I with, with her was I. I thought without her that I'd die. But her old man had made it plain. A lonely grave was all I'd gain. If ever I stood in his sight, he'd kill us both from pure spite. So I asked, so I, and so I made an abrupt out and about turn and left there never to return. But I'd sworn I'd see him snuff. And though you thought you'd offered enough gold to buy my bravery, I would have done the job for free. <laughs> for 30 long, long years I'd waited. Now my vengeance is sated. 
I'll shuffle off this mortal coil and go and watch the coffee boil. In that great tavern in the sky where Mongols go wherever they die, my one regret that I've not known a family life and lived alone, with no real chance to lay my head on what I'd truly call a bed. But life's too short for those what ifs. I leave them for some other stiffs, and with a final, final smile, it's made this living worthwhile. And with those words, he went away. Goodbye, old son. All I could say. We laid him out and built a pyre, raked his ashes from the fire, and put them in a little chest, and wondered where he'd like them best. Before our army's next campaign, I said, I've had enough of pain and death. It seems to me that it had come, to, had come the time for me to quit and end a life of soldiering. So with a smile from a grateful king, I took my pay and booty too, a bag of gems of crimson hue, an emerald looted from a priest, a pig or two on which to feast, some feathered hats and silks, of course, a stolen heart, a cart, and a stolen horse. All this I loaded up on top, and something made me turn and stop. Before I homeward strolled along, I thought about my mate, the mom. I grabbed the place and said, old oh, mate, I know a place for you that's great. When I got home, I stopped to sup at a tavern near where I grew up. I showed the man who tapped the keg and ruby really like a pigeon's egg. And said that there's another three if you will sell this pub to me. Barn and gulped and thought a while. I gave the man a manic smile. That I practice in the field and had made me brave me. The barkeep cop took my subtle hint, and by a very cunning dint of bargaining extracted not just for just for rubies that he'd got but also my cut horse and cart to take away. But I was happy I could stay, at last a place to call my own, a thing my mate had never known. But now he sits behind the bar, observing folk from near and far. And so I hope he's happy here, surrounded by the smell of beer. And I've put his bold visage as our pub sign central charge, and named the tavern for his name, and hope the everlasting fame will seem to him a winning jest. He liked uns unsubtle humour best. Two great things he taught me that every man should know. If he would into foreign countries, soldier and go. If looking for a sudden strike to make a battle for an end, always pick a gutsy man who won't betray a friend. And also that there's one thing even tyrants cannot budge, and that's a little Mongol with a 30-year-old grudge. <laughs>